either starring in an intimate drama or a spectacular blockbuster, reciting Shakespeare or casting magical spells, Emma Thompson has become one of the country's most admired and best loved actresses. Thank you. You know, I watched that montage and I thought, wasn't I lucky to be born with a good set of teeth just here? I think that's accounted for an awful lot. It's all down to the teeth. Mostly, no. yeah. I, I remember Brian Blessed seeing Howard's end and saying to me afterwards, are they all your own teeth, Emma? <laughs> I was, yes, unfortunately they are. The bottoms that aren't too good, they sort of come out like the aliens, <laughs> you know, in that thing where they just suddenly come out. Anyway, it's horrifying. Was there ever anything else you kind of thought, oh, well, I could do that rather than being an actor? I did, I did consider being a hospital administrator. Uh, because I was at Camden School for Girls in Camden Town. A woman came, I think they do it a lot more now, but someone from the outside world came to speak oh. to us. She was a hospital administrator and she had very good shoes and was very articulate. So I thought, that looks like a good job to me. So I went home and said to my mum and dad, what do you think? And they said, good stuff. I think they were quite excited that well, I wasn't going into the theatre. Avoiding show business. Exactly, right. yes, exactly. Right. But then I... Uh, it all went horribly wrong. Yeah. And I tried stand-up until I realised that if I carried on doing it, I would be dead of a heart attack before <laughs> I was 30 because I've ne nothing is so frightening. Nothing. Then after that, I did my own television series for which the response was very different. So, yeah. you know, it, it went into... It all went downhill, really, from then on. <laughs> I look at it now and I think, oh, that's interesting because the comedians coming up now, like Catherine Tate and Katie Brand, are doing the same kind of thing, Absolutely. but much later on, and you go, OK, so it's taken time. Then you started doing some uh, big, serious films. Uh, let's start with Howard's End. It's the only time I've ever written to somebody to oh. say, I really do know who this woman is and I can play her. Please let me. I did, I wrote to James Ivory, wow. who I like very much. Yeah. I've never minded auditioning. I'd audition happily for anyone, any time, now. I've, it's nice. And you won an Oscar for that, the I first did. Oscar. How, how, how did that feel? I mean, a young, fairly young, to first Oscar, what's it like? <laughs> well, it was surreal, actually, because um, it's not like it is now. The Oscars now is very big. It's, it's, I mean, there's Oscar parties, everyone's aware of it. But when I was a girl, I was well, I wasn't a girl, I was 32, I think. Um, it was a very far away thing. It was an iconic object that existed very far away and belonged to people like Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn, even to, a, to another age. It did, I didn't really take it in. I wasn't in that world. I was in comic world. I didn't think about it. So I went with my mum and we had to dress up and get proper frocks and everything. And you get dressed up at about 11 o'clock in the morning. It's, it's ghastly. And then you get into a limousine, sit in that for a couple of hours. And um, mum was wearing a dress which had a long train, I remember. And everyone who trod on it, thus choking her, <laughs> a la Isadora Duncan, was famous. So she would just turn around. <laughs> Every time, it was sort of like sound as of a bulldog being dragged on a chain. And I would turn around and there would be Placido Domingo, for instance, or Al Pacino, and they would be apologising to my mother. And then we'd all have a chat. And so we got to meet an awful lot of people because of that <laughs> particular sartorial decision. Um, and it was great. Uh, and then when I got, the, got it, I remember I, Tony was up there opening the envelope and my mum turned around and said, you've got a chance in hell. <laughs> she always likes to put down a mattress, you know, in case of disappointment. Um, and the odd thing was not so much getting up and standing on stage and looking at the front row and everyone who's, who was sitting there was famous, everyone. But it was going backstage that made me realise the, um, the truly iconic quality of the Oscar because I had to haul up my tights. Um, Spanx did not exist in those days, um, and I handed it to a security guard, and I've never seen a face on him like it. He just, oh, wow. I could have been handing him the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> it was extraordinary, and I thought, oh. And I looked at it in a different way after that, the Oscar. I thought, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> And then we went back to the hotel and we were staying in a, in a room, me and mum, about the size of this chair. <laughs> and the following day, lots of flowers started to arrive and I, it was like a chapel of rest by the <laughs> afternoon. If we'd just laid down on the two little, tiny, little single truckle beds and gone like that, you could have come in and paid your respects and we'd all have been over and that would have been lovely. 
But then I, I had to take it home, and um, I, I, I wrapped it in a pair of socks, stuck it in my hand luggage, and it went through the, the security um, camera thing, clearly looking like some sort of nuclear warhead. Yeah. And uh, the, so I was asked to go out, and they took it out. And again, it was a Spielbergian moment, because this thing came out, they took the sock off, and it just went, Whoa! And everybody, all the security, all the Americans were just kind of passing it round, you know. I got it onto the plane. The captain of the bloody aeroplane was down. I said, can I hold it? I said, wait, is somebody flying the plane? Take the, take it, take it. Just go and get, what, keep your eyes on the road, for God's sake. That was the best bit. That was the, that was the most extraordinary thing when you realised what a, what a powerful object. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It yeah. is. As well as doing big, serious challenging roles. You're also doing Hollywood stuff. You did Junior, yes. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm. I love doing that because they paid me a lot of money for it. And, and also working with Arnold, who was, well, amongst other things, orange. As I think I mentioned, <laughs> uh, is, uh, the first orange person I'd ever met. Um, but nice, you know, yeah. very nice. Yeah. And was very honest about not being able to act. And oh, was he? How did, so how did, how did he say? Said, I'm not an actor, I'm a, a bodybuilder. So you help me, yes? I said, yes, that's fine. I said, will you help me with bodybuilding? <laughs> and he said, of course. So I have an entree into his gym at any time. Oh, perfect. I think not, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> not yeah. after recent events. Moving on, um, I want to talk about Richard Curtis and your, your uh, relationship with him. But Richard Curtis gets a lot of I think unfair attention and criticism, in, particularly in this country, about his films being mm. sentimental and all of that. What's your feeling about his work? Richard's a most unusual man. Um, and he's just built, it seems to me, of the milk of human kindness. It's time to get to uh, your new film. You've got off the of bank, P.L. Travis, this, the This script of... by Kelly Marcel is one of the best scripts I've read in a long time. And I just, again, as with most things that I've just said yes to, I say yes. Immediately, yeah, we were all surprised that Disney had let us make it in the first place. You know, Walt's there smoking cigarettes yeah. and drinking whiskey and all of that. And it's, it's the first film they've ever allowed him to be represented in. Um, and it's so interesting because it's, well, really, it's a, you could just call it daddy issues, actually. We have run out of time, unfortunately. So I just want to say thank you so much for letting us Not look at, at your Thank you for pictures. coming. Emma Thompson.